Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome author Ben McIntyre and moderator Johan Sorensen. Good, I, jet lag. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> um, so, so I have the pleasure of sitting here with uh, Ben McIntyre um, today. Is about Ben is um, associate editor at the Times of London, the Times, the Times, <laughs> and um, uh, uh, can't hear us. Okay, we'll talk up. Does that work? Let me also test mine. Is that okay? Okay, and um, international best-selling author of how many books? Twelve now. Twelve, um, all of them to be recommended, <laughs> um, and and today is is Rogue Heroes, where um, story of the SAS, and I, I mean, I guess today we're very familiar with asymmetrical warfare, with special forces operating in, in theatres all around the world. Um, but it was quite a revolutionary idea at the time. Uh, so, Ben, take us home to it. Well, the SAS, uh, I mean, today we were just discussing this earlier, you know, around the, the, the sort of trouble spots of the world, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, special forces are operating all the time. They are, they are operating covertly, they're operating asymmetrically, they're taking out high-value targets secretly and very efficiently in lots of cases. And we kind of accept that that is how a great deal of war is now fought. But in, 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 in the Second World War, that was a very revolutionary idea. Um, the whole notion, b because a lot of commanders on the Allied side and on the, on, on the Axis side saw war in, in, in First World War terms, that you had two, two armies that would meet on a battlefield and fight it out until one of them won. What happened in, 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 in the war is that a, a completely different sort of warfare was invented, and it was invented by a most unlikely group of people. It came from Delta Force, you know, the Navy SEALs. I mean, th those are the names we know today. Those are the direct descendants of a very small group of quite eccentric independent soldiers operating in the northern African desert in 1941. And that's the story that, I, that I've told in Rogue Heroes. And, and the reason I told it is really because it was one of the few books that I've ever written that came to me rather than my going out and finding it. I was approached by the SAS. Now, the SAS stands for the Special Air Service, and they are, in British um, sort of military mythology, they have a particular grip on the British imagination. They are... They are our equivalent of the, of the of U.S. Delta Force. Um, and they approached me and asked me uh, if I would like to write a history based on their secret archive. They have an extraordinary archive. that I can't even tell you where it is, I'm afraid. But it is, it's, a, it's a most remarkable thing. It's quite unlike any archive I've ever been in before because it doesn't just contain reports about what happened during the war. It contains letters, diaries, postcards, memos, poems and thousands of photographs. Uh, one of the things the SAS was extremely good at uh, is taking photographs of themselves. It's almost as if they had a, they had a kind of premonition that they were going to be um, extremely famous after the war. And I always think with the cover of, you can't quite see it here, but the, um, the cover of the, uh, of the book that we chose, they look exactly like a rock band about to go on stage. They've got sort of dark glasses on and sheepskin jackets, and they know they're incredibly cool. Uh, they were also uh, fairly mad it has to be said. Um, <laughs> this is a picture of, of them in the desert. I, I, the way to start this story, probably, uh, is to start with a particular individual uh, whose name, I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to crane around because I can't quite see the... A man called David Sterling. Now, David Sterling was a, a, an upper-class, public school-educated uh, Scottish aristocrat who, before the war, had done virtually nothing um, he tried at all sorts of different professions and failed at all of them. He was actually quite hopeless, David Sterling. But he happened to be um, lying in a hospital bed in Cairo in 1941. He was part of the commando force that had been sent out from Britain for the North African campaign. And he was exceptionally bored. Um, he, he really had almost nothing to do. Um, and the reason he was lying in a hospital bed was he'd attempted a parachute jump. Um, the first ever recorded parachute jump into the North African desert. And again, he did this because he was bored. And um, if I tell you how it came about, it gives you a slight idea of the sort of character we're dealing with here. David Sterling um, 
stole a, a, a set of parachutes from the dock in Suez, uh, persuaded a friend uh, to take him up in an aeroplane over the North African desert, uh, tied the ripcord of, um, uh, of the parachute to the chair leg inside the plane, opened the door and jumped out of it. Um, <laughs> it was completely the wrong sort of plane for this. Um, and the parachute snagged on the tail fin and tore out three of the, of the six panels in the, in, in the parachute. And he plummeted to earth at roughly five times the recommended speed. Um, <laughs> hit the ground, ba damaged his back extremely badly. Um, and was, as I say, lying in, in a hospital bed recovering when the whole idea of special forces, the SAS, came to him. Um, and perhaps before I explain what that was, let me just give you a, a small strategic picture of what the war was like in the North African desert. This was, of course, before America had, had, had joined the war, before Pearl Harbor. And a kind of actually rather a traditional battle was taking place on an enormous battlefield. I mean, the Libyan desert is vast. Um, and the two sides were kind of locked in stasis, really. It was a kind of tank battle that had stopped. So there was an enormously long front line stretching down through, through the Libyan desert. And on one side uh, were the British tanks, and on the other were the German tanks. And they were really going nowhere. And Sterling's inspiration was that if he and a group of highly trained soldiers could get behind the lines, behind this incredibly long, board, this long front, um, that they could creep up on the various airfields that were strung out along the North African coast, Benghazi, a name that has great redolence today, um, Benghazi, Tobruk, and so on, all the way down the, the Libyan coast. If he could get to the airfields there, blow up the planes on the ground, that they could therefore do considerable damage uh, to the Axis air power that was dominating the Mediterranean. I mean, he was an ambitious man, Sterling, and he, he, he sort of believed that he could actually change the course of the war by doing this. Um, and astonishingly, he got permission to try. Not without some... I mean, it wasn't the easiest thing in the world to get permission. No. It wasn't a kind of straight, go <laughs> to your, you know, superior commander and then... By no means. I mean, uh, it's, it's hard to overestimate quite how unpopular this idea was. Um, I mean, a lot of the top brass deeply disapproved of what Sterling was planning to do. They had, a, as I say, a rather static conception of how war was going to be fought. And to use a British phrase, the idea that her ma His Majesty's soldiers were gonna simply going to creep up on the enemy and blow them up in the middle of the night um, didn't sound like cricket. It sounded like um, the sort of thing British people shouldn't be doing. So he was deeply opposed. Uh, but he compounded the problem for himself because Sterling was extremely disdainful of the top brass. Um, in fact, he referred to them loudly and publicly as layer upon layer of fossilized shit. Um, <laughs> because he, they wouldn't listen to him. And so he simply did what he really had in mind for the, for the front line. Instead of going through the top brass and, and getting formal permission, he simply went round them um, and, and did it more or less independently. He persuaded one particular general to give him effectively carte blanche uh, to try this very experimental form of, of warfare. And let me just know which one is. Sorry, I can't even see which one this is. I, I just wanted to introduce you to one or two of the characters. It's a little like a Dirty Dozen story, this one, because Sterling then set out to start recruiting the sort of people uh, that he thought he would need for this kind of warfare. And he described them at the time as the sweepings of the public schools and the prisons. Um, <laughs> which was an almost perfect description because many of the people he, he recruited were borderline psychotic. I mean, there's no other way of putting it. They were people who would not have found their way into command in any other unit. And this is a man called Paddy Main, um, who was a sort of legendary soldier. He, he'd been a, an international rugby player uh, for Ireland um, before the war. He was exceptionally brave. He was completely alcoholic, um, apart from anything else. He was sort of unable to do anything without at least a bottle of whiskey inside him. Uh, and he was an amazing battlefield commander. He had... He had that rare quality in, in war of being able to persuade men to follow him into, into, into really the most perilous situations. Um, this is another character who's, who's largely forgotten to history. Um, who's, oh, goodness, what was that? Um, I know. That's, your, that's your pack there. Um, who was the training officer for the, um, the SAS. Um, he was a very strange man. He... I love this particular painting, which is by Rex Whistler. This is their training ground in, in Aldershot. It's actually a, a rather famous race course. Uh, 
um, at Sandown Racecourse. And it looks to me exactly as if he's about to mow down Jock Lewis, his name was, mow down the runners and riders in the 315, um, which he could easily have done. Um, this is a man called Reg Seekings, who was, a, who was a, a, an NCO. He was a sort of foul-mouthed, one-eyed boxer from Cambridge. Um, who He was one of those re very few people who was able to kill without any kind of remorse. Didn't see, uh, and again, I think he was probably um, fairly unhinged. Um, but he was the sort of person that you really wanted to go into battle with in this sort of war. And completely at the other end of sort of human life was his closest friend, a man called uh, Johnny Cooper, who, who looks like a teenager there. Um, and indeed, he was a teenager when he got into uh, the SS. He lied about his age. He was only 17. And there are lots of photographs of Johnny Cooper th um, in, in the archives. And one of the things about Johnny Cooper was that he has a broad smile on his face throughout the war, in spite of having seen some truly horrendous things. So um, th this is Sterling again. With so he gathered about 60 of these kind of pretty ruffianly figures. And um, they started training in parachuting in Cabrit, which is near um, the Suez Canal. They trained in unarmed combat, in parachuting, and, and above all in explosives. They were really a sabotage unit. Uh, the idea was that they would creep onto the airfields at night, attach... Um, sort of portable bombs to the underside of, of planes, blow off one wing off every plane, uh, and do alternate wings, because that was otherwise they worked out that if you blew all the right-hand wings off, they would simply make another set of right-hand wings, so that if you did right and left, it was going to be much more difficult to replace them. Um, and then, um, which is this one, this is the marching across the desert. They also trained in kind of long desert marches, surviving without water and food for, for extremely long periods. Um, Sterling was convinced that the best way to train for parachuting was to jump out of a speeding truck <laughs> at about 30 or 40 miles an hour. Um, that's actually a really stupid way to train for parachuting <laughs> because you're going the wrong way. You're going horizontally instead of vertically. And quite a lot of people uh, were b quite badly injured um, as a result of Sterling's training program. Um, but in a way, that was part of the idea. I mean... It, it, the parachuting was really a way of testing metal, apart from anything else. He was trying to see if these people would, under orders, jump out of the back of a speeding truck. Um, the first operation uh, was called Operation Squatter. Shall I do the quick spiel on Operation Squatter? Uh, Operation Squatter was an unmitigated catastrophe. Um, the idea was to parachute 53 heavily armed parachutists behind the lines, uh, way behind the lines in the, in, in the Libyan desert, and that they would then creep onto the airfields and blow up everything they could find. Um, Operation Squatter uh, in November 1942 took place in the middle of the worst storm in the North African desert for 30 years. Um, gale force winds. Sterling really should have called it off. I mean, he had the opportunity to call it off um, uh, and, and was told that he could do so without... Um, fear or favour. The truth is, he felt that had he called off the operation, um, the SAS would have been stillborn, that it would never have happened. The whole idea would have been called off, that his enemies within sort of top brass in, in, in British high command would simply have killed it at that moment. So he pushed ahead with it, but he shouldn't have done so. And they parachuted out. There were 53 of them. Um, of the 53, I mean, many of them vanished without trace, were never seen again. All of them were blown wildly off course. Um, the rain that was pouring down when they hit the ground soaked into all the bombs they were carrying and made them completely unusable. Some of them, believe it or not, were scraped to death on the desert floor. I mean, they, would, they couldn't get out of their parachutes because the, rain, the, the wind was so high. And of the 53 people uh, that went in, only 21 came back again. Um, so it was, it was a disaster. Um, but... Instead of being sort of cowed by this, Sterling hit on another idea. I mean, amazingly, uh, his report on Operation Squatter, it was a miracle of economy. Um, he really didn't tell the, the bosses what had happened at all. He just covered it up. But he worked out that the people who, the way they, after Operation Squatter, they got out of the desert again was that a group called the Long Range Desert Group, who were a sort of desert reconnaissance team, really. They were highly efficient desert-trained soldiers, many of them um, from what was then the colonies from New Zealand and 
in Australia. Uh, so they were trained in desert warfare, and they knew how to drive across the desert for long, long periods. And so they would pick up, they picked up the survivors from Operation Squatters and, and took them out. So Sterling worked out from this that if, if, if the long-range desert group could take them out of the desert, the long-range desert group could, could take them in again. Quite why this blindingly obvious solution to the problem had not occurred to anyone before <coughs> is one of the mysteries of the SAS story, because actually, looking back on it, it was, it was the obvious way to do it. Uh, and so they began what became an extremely effective alliance with the long-range desert group. I mean, there uh, you described the p particularly one of them, his ability to navigate. I've spent some time in the desert. Mm. Uh, it takes about two minutes to not know left from right. Yeah their ability to actually navigate through endless desert. And it, it was extraordinary. I mean, they, they invented a thing called the Bagnold Sun Compass, which was, a, which was a special sort of compass that could be attached to the front of these American-made Jeeps. I mean, the arrival of the, of the Willys Bantam Jeep in North Africa actually transformed the battlefield in many ways. These American-made Jeeps could, could drive for hugely long periods. They had exactly two gears, forward and back. And and they were almost indestructible. I mean, they had about six moving parts, and you just carried the extra moving parts, and you could... I mean, the Willys Bantam Jeep could go anywhere. Um, but no, they were extraordinary navigators. And there's w the only survivor from the original SAS troop is, is a man called Mike Sadler, who, who was their navigator, who's now 97 uh, and lives in, in, in Britain and, and is blind now. But he was an amazing desert navigator. He had that kind of nostril that could kind of navigate across 500 miles of almost almost entirely featureless desert um and then that was that was that was an amazing achievement at the time it was i mean now we sort of take it for granted with gps but they really were uh, extraordinary and the the uh, i mean here you see them setting off this is just before christmas in in 1941 that's paddy main again i mean paddy main uh, as i think i said before was was a brilliant soldier but he really was hinged nuts. I mean, he. Th th there's an account in the SAS archives of a particular operation that he was part of, in which with some glee, he describes how they crept onto an airfield at night uh, and noticed that there was a sort of party taking place in one of the wooden mess huts, a group of Italian and German pilots. And they were there just to, to bomb the planes, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, I should probably go back a stage. I mean, wo once, once the long-range desert group came in, and they knew they could get in and out. They began this campaign of bombing, and it was hugely successful. I mean, Paddy Main, for example, destroyed more aircraft than any fighter pilot on either side during the war. And all the planes that he destroyed were on the ground. I mean, none of them had taken off. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of, of Italian and German planes were destroyed on the ground. And this had different effects. I mean, one of them was that, of course, it obviously degraded Axis air power. But in a way, just as importantly, it, it meant that the Germans and Italians had to start reinforcing and protecting the airfields in a way that they hadn't done before. So lots of frontline soldiers were being pulled back from the front um, to sort of reposition. And it also sowed a kind of... Uh, panic is too strong a word, but, but the story of the so-called Phantom Major, which is what they called Sterling, became part of kind of both sort of British military folklore, but also... Axis kind of folklore. I mean, and, and they were terrified. They, would, they, they didn't know at what point he was going to be creeping onto the airfield with these tiny units of men. They were only five to a unit, and they could arrive at any time. So it, it had a kind of demoralizing effect that is very hard to measure, but was extremely substantial. And it was partly because they were completely ruthless. Uh, um, and main story, it's just one element of what I found in the archive. It, it, there's a sort of handwritten account of an occasion when he, he saw, as I say, this party taking place in a, in a sort of nearby hut. And he simply, with two other men, went up to the hut, hut, opened the door, walked in, and then the three of them simply shot everybody inside that they could, and then closed, rolled in two hand grenades and closed the door. And, and they probably killed about 35 people that night. Um, and it was, a, it was bloodletting. I mean, it was, it was you know, it wasn't part of the Geneva Convention that. And even Sterling was, was, a, was appalled by it. I mean, he, he hauled Paddy Main in and said, you know, this is, this is not how we should be doing it. But it was sort of part of, the, part of the story, really. But they weren't all like that. I mean, there were <coughs> one or two of them who were much more sensitive and much more, um, what's the word, much more civilized in lots of ways. This is one of my favorite characters uh, who was known as the Parachute Padre. Uh, he was the Reverend uh, McCluskey, and he was the, he was the, the first... <coughs> 
um, chaplain to accompany the SAS. And he went on every single one of the toughest missions, and he never carried a gun. And he, his writing is very interesting. Again, his personal account is in the archive, and he writes rather movingly and rather kind of poignantly about whether men of God should carry weapons and what his particular role was in the regiment. And it's, um, it's an interesting story. I think he'd be worth a biography on his own in some ways. Um, life expectancy on these operations was about four weeks, an average of four weeks. Um, they died in huge numbers because, of course, if you're creeping onto an airfield at night and the guards realize you're there, your chances of getting out are very low. And more to the point, even if you do get out, there was then, as dawn would come up after these raids, and don't forget they had, they had at least a two-day drive to get back out of range. These terrible cat and mouse chases would take place in the desert effectively. So any of the surviving planes from the airfields that they'd attack would simply come up at dawn and then try and track them back through the desert. And Jock Lewis here, you see the, the training officer, the painting of which I showed you earlier. Um, on Christmas Eve 1941, he and his troop were caught in the open by <coughs> um, German Stukas and dive bombed. Uh, and he, he was hit, um, his, his jeep was hit, uh, his leg was, um, his femoral artery was severed and he died very quickly. I mean, um, that's what th one of the things. So anyone who's familiar with your, with your books, mm. you do a, just a marvelous job. Anyone here who's read Ben's books, one of the compelling things is how you bring characters to life and and y you manage to endear us to characters who, who objectively are completely bonkers. <laughs> um, and it, and, but unlike some of the espionage books, you, you read this one, you become very fond of these, this bunch of kind of creative psychopaths. Um, but unlike a novel, they're then, they're then dead. Yeah. I mean, in huge numbers, you're like, oh, I, I love, I love, oh no, he's dead. Yeah. I mean, and just, just kind of sleuths of. It is. It was one of the one of the it was one of the tricky things about writing this book, actually, is because, as you say, my my previous books tend to follow a kind of n narrative arc that is novelistic in its way, although nothing is made up. But you know, the goodies win and the baddies don't. But in this story, quite a lot of the goodies don't make it halfway through the book, um, and. The replenishment of the ranks is, is one of the sort of slightly odd parts of this, is that new... Ca I found the first half of the book, in a way, is, is, was quite easy to structure because there were a very small number of people at the beginning. But as the SAS became more and more successful, they, um, they recruited lots more people. And, and, and it becomes a rather more diffuse narrative because they are suddenly doing all sorts of different operations, and I'm sort of getting ahead of myself here. But, but no, the, the, the sort of suddenness of death and the bleakness of the death. I mean, and Jock Lewis, his body was never recovered. He, he still, his bones still lie somewhere in the Libyan desert and were, were never found again. Um, see which one we've got here. Yes, I mean, it, this is a picture that I think wonderfully illustrates the fact that the SAS were very mindful of their own mythology. Uh, they dressed in, in this rather extravagant Arab garb. You know, they grew these big bushy beards. They often wore bandoliers and they wore, you know, they didn't wear conventional uniform. They wore whatever kit they could lay their hands on. I mean, again, I, uh, as I said, I don't know if I said this at the beginning, but I mean, this, this picture always struck me as they look exactly like a rock band um, about to go on stage. They know they're very cool. They, they, and, and that was part of the mythology because they realized, and actually this was, goes back to Churchill in a way, this, that they realized that war is not all about guns and bombs and bullets and territory. It's also about morale and at the time that the SAS came into existence, the morale of the 8th Army, the British Army in North Africa, was at rock bottom. We were losing the war. And I think Churchill, above all, realized that there had to be some sort of romantic, adventurous story to bring, to bring the army back again. And actually, they modeled themselves pretty clearly on the sort of desert fighters of an earlier war. They were really modeling themselves on Lawrence of Arabia in lots of cases. They were wearing the headdresses and the turbans and so on. Um, and they were very aware of their own their own history, really. This was, this was Christmas dinner um, uh, in 1942 that they just shot an antelope in the desert. Um, uh, yes, I mentioned Churchill. Churchill plays a very important part in the SAS story. And I, if I may, I'll just Please. quickly tell you one of the... Um, well, it's a, a strange sort of sideways story. Here, here you see a character who's often been forgotten to history, Randolph Churchill on the left there. Uh, Randolph was uh, Churchill's 
uh, eldest son, and he was a member very briefly of the SAS. Sterling was rather unwilling to have him in the SAS because he was extremely unfit uh, and mostly quite drunk. Um, but he was um, he was good fun, Randolph, and he was a he was a journalist. Um, not that they're always good fun, but sometimes they are. And he and um, I think Sterling calculated rather cynically that if he could get Randolph interested in the SAS project, that Randolph would report this back to his father and that that would assure the future of the SAS. Um, and so he took Randolph on briefly and, and took him on one of the least successful SAS operations of all. It was called Operation Bigamy. Um, and uh, it involved uh, this thing, this car that they'd got hold of, which they called the Blitz Buggy which was a kind of staff car which they adapted um, so that it could carry uh, anti-aircraft guns fore and aft uh, in, in the front and in the back. And here you see Sterling about to set off with Randolph Churchill. The idea was, was pretty simple. Uh, they, they were going to try and get into the port of Benghazi, which was the most important Axis-held port at that point. And the idea was that they were going to get down to the harbour secretly, stuffed with German and Italian soldiers, They'd, they'd sort of creep down to the harbour. They would then inflate uh, two kayaks and paddle out to the shipping that was moored in the harbour. They were then going to attach limpet mines uh, to, the, to the ships, sink them all in the harbour so that no more shipping could come in or out, and then they were going to run away. Um, that was the idea. And they took... Um, sophisticated. Sophisticated <laughs> idea. I mean, it, I've, I've simplified it, but it was pretty simple. Um, and it was... I mean, it was uh, to describe it as risky doesn't really do credit. I mean, it was it was it was it was borderline nuts, but but it was very exciting. So they set off in the Blitz buggy and they arrived down at the, the harbour um, in the dead of night, and they crept onto the harbour and they tried to inflate these two kayaks, and neither of them would inflate because they pu they punctured them on the way in. <laughs> um, so they decided to call off the operation. They began to creep out of the of the thing, um, and there was there were four of them in the troop. And they suddenly realised that suddenly they, their numbers had swelled to six uh, because two Italian soldiers, <laughs> apparently believing that some sort of midnight parade was, was going on, <laughs> had attached themselves to the back of the line <laughs> as they were marching out of the harbour. And I think it was the only time in the war that, that Allied and Axis troops sort of marched together in perfect <laughs> harmony. Um, and w what I should have said at the beginning is that one of the characters who came along on this raid was a wonderful man called Fitzroy MacLean. If you haven't read Fitzroy MacLean's Eastern Approaches, it's one of the most brilliant accounts of the chaos of war. Um, and he was a very uh, interesting and, 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 and clever man. But he was born along particularly because he spoke Italian. And it was thought that he would be very useful for getting them through the guard posts. Well, he did speak Italian, but he spoke, he'd learned all his Italian from studying Renaissance art. <laughs> And so he spoke a kind of weird 15th century Italian. <laughs> it was this strange Rococo kind of language. And so <laughs> as they were creeping out of this thing with two Italian soldiers following along behind them, uh, Fitzroy MacLean, he was clearly sort of completely off his head on adrenaline by this point, decided that he would inspect the Italian guard. <laughs> so he summoned them in this kind of strange Renaissance Italian out of the guardhouse. Pretty sire, wilt. Follow me into yonder <laughs> bush where I can address thine, thine honour. And I think the Italians were so <laughs> astonished by this performance. One of them actually fell over, <laughs> according, to, according to his account. So, <laughs> so having sort of had this parade, and I think the Italians were just utterly baffled by what was going on. They were pretending to be German staff officers. That was the idea. Um, they climbed back into the Blitz buggy and, and shot off again uh, and had a tremendous car accident on the way back. Um, but... His plan did work because, because Randolph Churchill did indeed write these rather wonderful letters describing this totally abortive operation to his father. And they're, they're in the archive and they're, they're wonderfully sort of colourful and slightly ludicrous and, and overwritten. But Churchill, it was the kind of operation that Winston Churchill absolutely loved, this kind of romantic skullduggery sort of war that wasn't kind of conventional, that was sort of sideways way, way of doing things. And it really caught Churchill's imagination. And here, I, I don't know if you can even read it from here, but this is, a, this is a memo that was sent to Sterling from Churchill himself, from Churchill's secretary, saying, I want to know all about the SAS, fill me in on absolutely how this stuff works. And really from that moment on, and we're, we're still quite early on in the war here, we're still, this is early in 1943, 
from that moment on, the SAS, the Special Air Service, this, this original Special Forces group, the future of it was assured, and it expanded hugely. Uh, it, it, grew, it grew from, as I say, about 100 men to, by the time of the Italian campaign, there were 3,000 SAS soldiers doing all sorts of asymmetric warfare all over the battlefields, mostly sabotage, uh, but also linking up with, with partisans and so on. So um, the, the sort of next stage of the war, of course, Sterling, um, uh, Sterling did meet Churchill. Uh, they, uh, uh, when Churchill was on his way to, to uh, Moscow to see Stalin, he stopped off in Cairo, and there was a dinner party that Sterling attended at Churchill's request. Um, and I p Sterling was under strict orders not to tell Churchill what he was up to, because Churchill was a brilliant wartime leader, but he was also a tremendous sort of after-dinner show-off. Uh, and he, he would boast about what was going on, and it was, they were f it was feared that, you know, if you told Winston too much, he'd just tell everybody. Um, so Sterling was under strict orders not to tell him what he was up to, so he immediately broke that and told, and told Churchill absolutely everything, and, and Churchill was fascinated by it. Um, and at the end of it, gave him sort of carte blanche. But one of the things that Sterling did, Sterling was having great trouble getting supplies for his men. He couldn't get enough ammunition, he couldn't get enough jeeps, he couldn't get enough food. Um, uh, but at the end of this meal, he, he asked uh, Winston Churchill to sign a napkin for him as a, as a souvenir. As soon as he got out of the dinner, he took the, he took the napkin and got <coughs> his secretary to type on top of it, please give the bearer any <laughs> munitions and requirements that he has for the rest of the war. And so from that moment on, Sterling had never had any problem with getting <laughs> whatever he wanted because he had Winston Churchill's authority. Um, I mean, I know this sounds sort of mad, but and it was slightly mad. I mean, you can see they are... They are ruffianly figures. They are not conventional soldiers. This is, this is uh, another character preparing for, for battle in the desert. This is, a, again, another set of extraordinary photographs that I found in the archive. Um, this is a man called Jack Story, who was separated from his unit on the coast of, of, of to, uh, near Tobruk and managed to walk back through the desert 180 miles uh, without water, without food or water, drinking his own urine, um, as he went, as you do. And um, it's an astonishing tale of survival. I mean, he, uh, you see him here, you can only just see them. His feet are completely bandaged. This was actually only 24 hours after he'd got back to the camp. Uh, and they were made of a particularly resilient material, these guys. I mean, they, 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 you know, they died in large numbers, but those that survived were, were, were tough as blazes. And they did change the course of the war. I mean, Montgomery, you see him here... Um, it was initially very sceptical about the SAS. He didn't really believe in them, but he came to realize that actually they were having a, a vital effect on the battlefield. And he said of Sterling, the boy Sterling is mad, quite, quite mad. But in war, there is always a place for mad people. And I think that is, that is sort of true. Um, I do want to leave some time for questions. Um, I won't tell you this story because it's actually it's quite a long one, but this is the... One of the reasons why the SAS lost so many men was, in fact, they were penetrated by German spies. There were, there were German and Italian spies who had got into the, into the minds of the SAS, particularly among the prisoners. And uh, the huge death toll uh, from October 1943 was largely down to this man, whose name was Theodore Skirch, who was a, a, a British citizen who had effectively was working for Italian and German military intelligence. He was executed after the war. Uh, he was actually the only... Um, British soldier to be executed for treachery in the course of the war. Um, I can't even see what that one is. What have we got there? Oh yes. Well, this is the this is really the next stage of the war. I mean, after the Italian campaign, where the SAS are really used as sorry, popping a bit here, uh, were used as sort of frontline troops. They weren't very well used in the Italian campaign. The next stage of the war for the SAS is occupied France, and that in the run up to D-Day and immediately afterwards. Huge numbers of, of SAS troops were parachuted behind the lines in France to link up with the Maquis, with the resistance cells there, and to create havoc, effectively. They were, they were instructed to do as much damage as they possibly could, and specifically to try and stop the panzer divisions that were based in the south of France from moving north and reinforcing um, uh, uh, the, the troops, the German troops that were defending against the Allied invasion. And, and they were extremely effective. A, a, a large number of American and British and Commonwealth lives were saved because the SAS were slowing down, particularly the advance of the Das Reich Panzer Division, which was a sort of crack uh, Panzer Division. And they slowed them down for days. And again, many of them were, were killed in the process. 
yes, you, here you see them parachute training before D-Day. Um, this horrendous photograph, um, I won't dwell on this too long, but the SAS were the first people into Belsen. Uh, they were the first um, allied soldiers to, to relieve that appalling um, death camp. They arrived and there were thousands of people dying. Uh, in, in the, and the reason why I dwell on this, I mean, we're coming towards the end of the war here. And bear in mind that the SAS have lost a lot of soldiers because Hitler, by this point, had, had passed his notorious commando order, which was an order that any allied soldiers found behind the lines, whether they were in uniform or not, were to be summarily executed. And lots and lots and lots of them were killed uh, by the SS. So there was a huge kind of fury within the SAS ranks against the sort of ruthless brutality of the, of the Nazi regime. When they arrived in Bergen-Belsen, um, the SS were still in command, uh, and they were continuing business as usual. And there was, there's a very telling moment, I thought, when one SS soldier was sort of systematically beating up one of the, one of the prisoners in Bergen-Belsen. <coughs> and the chap I mentioned at the beginning, Reg Seekings, the one-eyed boxer, sort of stepped forward and asked for permission to, to teach this guy a lesson uh, and knocked him out with a single punch. And by that time, all the SS soldiers in Bergen-Belsen had lined up in front of the SAS. Uh, and you would have thought that this might be a moment for summary retribution, that the SAS might easily have simply shot every single SS officer and soldier in that place. And you might argue that they would have had every reason to do so. But what happened was very different. Uh, and the commander of the SAS, who was a man called John Tonkin, forgotten to history, Captain John Tonkin, stood in front of his own soldiers and said, on no account are any of you to open fire. These men need to be disarmed and tried, and if they're guilty, they will be executed. And here you see um, the commander of Bergen-Belsen uh, being arrested by an SAS soldier, and he was duly tried and then executed after the Nuremberg trials. And that moment has always struck me as a peculiar instance of true humane civility in the middle of an utterly brutal and disgusting war. And it's a rather emblematic moment, I think, because the SAS were tough. We know they were tough. The red mist came down. There are plenty of incidents in this book that do not reflect terribly well on the SAS. They were quite capable of, they were, they were rogues as well as heroes. They were capable of doing some terrible things. But when, at that particular moment, they managed to kind of hold back and behave in a way that I, I've always thought was truly civilized. Um, and so at, at, at the liberation, this is the liberation of France here, the SAS after the war was disbanded. Um, like many um, Allied units, there was thought to be no room for them in, in the next stage of war. Um, it was widely assumed that the next war would be a nuclear one, and therefore these small units of highly trained soldiers uh, would be unnecessary. Um, Britain realized very quickly that that wasn't the case, and the SAS was reconstituted in 1948 and became a template for special forces around the world. Um, not just in America, but in New Zealand, Australia, France. The SAS idea caught on very, very quickly afterwards and, and really is one of the reasons today why we have, why we have special forces. So, sorry, I've rabbited rather there, but um, we have a little time for questions. And, and, and Johan, you may have one if you want to ask. No, no, um, no, please. I don't think, well, look, some of them did become mercenaries. I mean, you know, they, they, were, they were tough cookies and they had, you know, skills for sale once they left the SAS. No, there is, a, I mean, the SAS and other special forces are used in, th they're much more controlled now than they were when they began. And I mean that in a good way. They are not, I mean, Sterling was effectively given a blank check and told that he could do whatever he wanted to do, really, to, to sort of degrade the, the Axis war effort. That, that's not the case today. I mean, special forces are much more tightly controlled. The SAS did operate in Rhodesia. Um, 
And quite a lot of ex-SAS soldiers did end up in the Rhodesian Defence Force, um, trying to, you know, trying to keep it white rule. I mean, so there, yes, I mean, there are many instances of, of former Special Forces soldiers being used in ways that are not very creditable. But, but, <coughs> but when they're organised, they're, they're organised extremely well. And the reason why the SAS came to, came to public attention, really, was not until 1984, when there was, I don't know if any of you remember it, but there was the siege of the Iranian embassy in London when a group of, of Iranian terrorists had sort of taken over the embassy. And the SAS stormed it highly effectively. And, and there were these amazing sort of, do you remember it? The, mm. sort, of, the, the sort of news footage of the SAS <coughs> bursting through the windows. And that was really the first, and I, I mean, that's the other thing about the SAS and special forces generally, is they do surround themselves with this intense carapace of secrecy, really. I mean, that was why it was such an extraordinary moment, really, to be allowed full access to the secret archives. Um, which, of course, I mean, some people in the SAS still think that shouldn't have happened. I mean, sem some of them think that this book shouldn't have been written. Um. What happened to him? Uh, David Stelling was one of those interesting people whom, whom war kind of found a role that he would never have found anywhere else, I don't think. He, his after war is rather sad in some ways. He never really found, he was, he was not right for the regular army. He was too wild. He was too uncontrolled. Um, he, he was actually captured before the end of the, um, of the African campaign by the Germans and, and spent the rest of the war in Kolditz, in, in, in the sort of famous prisoner of war camp. He, he, after the war, he set up various um, businesses, but he never really found a role. And like Paddy Main, actually, uh, you know, the alcohol got them in the end. Um, th I mean... Maine became a, a really serious alcoholic and, and killed himself in a car crash <coughs> in 1956. So I, I, I haven't dwelled very much on the afterlife of, of, so of, of these soldiers because in many cases I think the war was such a devastating experience, such a fascinating moment, such, a, such an exciting moment that peace, that they could survive in war in a way that they could never really quite thrive in peace. And so the afterwar of, of many of them is, is, is a slightly chilling story. And that is one thing that I've taken from this book. I mean, I, I found the word heroes in the title sometimes a little difficult because they are heroic in lots of ways. But one thing I took away from this war is that, of uh, this book, is that war damages everybody. Nobody comes out of war dignified. Nobody comes out of it glorified. Men, women, soldiers, partisans, civilians, children, <coughs> everybody is damaged. And it, and one of the things that war does is that it forces terrible decisions on ordinary people. They have to make the most appalling choices that they haven't chosen themselves. And I'll just give you one very quick illustration of that, which really was always stuck with me, which is a, there was a man called Sutton who parachuted in with the SAS towards the end of the war, behind the lines. And he and four others landed uh, in the sort of west of France, and they were immediately captured by the SS, and four of them were executed on the spot. But Sutton survived, and he told an extraordinary story about how he had fought off a, a, a German troop with a Bren gun, how he'd escaped, how he'd been captured again, how he'd spent the rest of the war in captivity, and how he'd sort of, you know, he'd, he'd, he'd never broken. And I read this account in the SS archives, and then I looked at the Nuremberg trials, and the problem with the Sutton's account is that it's not true. Uh, he didn't do that. Uh, he was offered the choice between being murdered on the spot or cooperating with his Gestapo and SS captors, and he chose the latter path. Uh, now, whether that led to the death of others, I've never quite been able to establish, but he bartered his own skin for cooperation. Now, well, part of me thought, well, I should really be condemning that. You know, th the others decided that they would, you know, they wouldn't bend, they wouldn't say what they were doing, and they, they, they went to their deaths. So I should really condemn it, but I couldn't, actually, because two things occurred to me. One is that I'm not at all sure that I wouldn't have given that choice. I wouldn't have gone, made the same. I'd like to think I wouldn't, but I, you never know until you're in that position whether I wouldn't have made the same decision. But I do know that I probably wouldn't have volunteered to parachute into occupied France in the first place. Um, <laughs> That, you know, that th it's easy for us at this distance to look back on, on these choices and to say, ah, you know, to make a moral judgment on them. If there's one thing that these sort of histories ask, and I, I, without giving you a pat answer, is what would you do? 
what would you have done in those circumstances? And if you think you know, you probably don't. Um, yes. The question is a good one. W was there infighting within the regiment? Yes, there was plenty, actually. There was lots of clashes of personality. Sterling was a very hard taskmaster. His fights with Paddy Main were legendary. Um, but I think that was part of the motor that made it run, in a way. I mean, if you have a completely consensual kind of unit, you're not going to manage very well. And one of the, uh, part of the fun of the book and part of the interest of the book was trying to work out how these very different characters and personalities kind of managed to get along just long enough to, to have such a dramatic effect on the war. Okay, we're end of time. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very ben. much indeed. <laughs>